Hi everybody, welcome to the Top 2 Inches of Sport podcast with me, Anthony Sheriff. This is a podcast about something that's always fascinated me, the mindset required to succeed in elite level sport. On this podcast, I'm going to talk to people who I really look up to in the world of sport and try to find out how they deal with the highs and lows that come with consistently striving for success in the unforgiven environment of elite sport. For the first episode, I spoke to Irish boxing superstar, Michael Conlon. From a boxing family in Belfast, Michael shot to national fame after winning a bronze medal at the London 2012 Olympics and his boxing career has went from strength to strength ever since. In 2015, Michael became the first Irish man to ever win gold at the World Amateur Boxing Championships. Perhaps his most famous moment came in the 2016 Rio Olympics where he was on the wrong side of a horrendous judging decision which robbed him of the opportunity of fulfilling his boyhood dream of becoming an Olympic champion. Michael is now excelling as a professional boxer with 13 wins from 13 contests and he hopes to challenge for a world title in the very near future. In this episode, Michael talks about the mental side of the sport and the mindset he has developed through years of ups and downs in boxing. We discuss the most famous nights of his amateur and professional career and talk about what he has learned from these experiences. So hopefully you enjoy the top two inches of sport with today's guest, Irish boxer, Michael Conlon. Right, we are recording with Michael Conlon. Michael, I know you're over in training camp. You're probably stiff and sore and tired and everything that comes with that. So thanks a million for coming on and speaking to me today. Okay, you didn't have to do it, so really, really appreciate it. Ah, no problem. Listen, it's always good for me. I'm, I'm here in London in training camp, so it's always good for me to hear voices from home. It's, it feels uh, it's much better, so um, it's no problem at all. Cheers, come on. So basically, like I was explaining to you off camera there, we're just going to do a little podcast to talk about the mentality of sport. So in this case, obviously boxing. So I'm going to talk to you just about like different moments in your career and what your mentality was going into that. And then maybe how you dealt mentally with like setbacks and also some successes as well. Sound yeah. good? No problem. Good. So first thing I want to ask you is I want to go way back. So me and myself, like, I'm a massive boxing fan. I can't get enough of it. But I know loads of people who just don't, understand at all the mentality of any human being wanting to walk into a boxing gym and have a, yeah. have a punch up uh, you you first went into the boxing gym I think when you were seven or eight years of age so what yeah. what attracts a seven-year-old lad from Belfast into a boxing gym um for me it wasn't there was no madness or anything behind it. it was just my big brothers they had to go to the gym to learn how to defend themselves and, and I just want to always be like my big brothers so I followed them and went to the gym and, and stayed at it ever since. But I remember being when when I started to go, the coach in the club at the time, um, said I was too young and I had to leave. And I remember crying my eyes out. And uh, after, it was after the three weeks, he says, he's too young. Bring him back when he's 10. I was seven. Three years is a long time when you're seven. And uh, I busted, busted out crying. I was disgusted. So I went and joined a different club and uh, started off at Clanner Boxing Club. Started my career there. And then I think it was when I was around nine, he seen me in like a club show, like a like a small kind of non-contest show, um, exhibition kind of thing. And he says to my dad, get him back right away. So I, I was happy to go back because it was my older brothers. But yeah. it's something that always sticks with me, like, you know, with... I wasn't. I was too. I was told I was too young when I just knew I wanted to do. It, knew I was gonna. When I was there, I kind of fell in love with it right away, and yeah, knew it was stuck out. That's brilliant. And you're saying like that you kind of wanted to be like your big brother. Now, for anyone listening that doesn't know your your brother Jamie was like a massively accomplished boxer in his own right. I think he won a Commonwealth title, didn't he? I'm off tell you, um, W European, W in the Continental. Um, he won. He won a good lot. Like he 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 achieved what he. One, but he obviously wanted to keep the world title, which is the only one he didn't get. Well, he did box for the world title, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he, got, he boxed, and unfortunately, he got stopped. He came up against a fantastic Filipino fighter in uh, German in, in Cajas, and uh, you know, it just was a step too far for him, really. Yeah, do, do you reckon? Like, do you reckon that's ever left you that kind of trying to impress your brother? Because just to kind of relate it to a different athlete, I remember listening to an interview with Thierry Henry, who like obviously achieved everything in football and he said that no matter what he won 
and like no matter how many people he played in front of all these stadiums, all he was ever really trying to do deep down was, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but he basically said he was just trying to get a well done off of his dad. That, that, he said that never left him. So even though you went on to like Olympic, uh, Olympic medals, you're obviously you're boxing in Madison Square Garden, all these places. Has that ever really left you, that kind of almost wanting to impress your brother? No, listen, he's, he's one of the only people that kind of outside of sport and in sport as well who I've really looked up to and uh, you know always admired. I think if Jamie had to stop boxing when I was 15, 16, more than likely I probably would have stopped boxing. Um, I just always wanted to be like him. I never really wanted to let him down and it's still probably the same. And I don't want to let him down when I'm boxing now. Now he's kind of managing me and looking after my career. Yeah. Um, and even when I spar and stuff, I don't even like, you know, spar and bar in front of him because I let him down. So, um, yeah, he's always someone to look up to and always someone who I'll continue to look up to. Yeah. Um, staying on your childhood for a moment, was it always just boxing or were you like any other Irish young lad? Did you give the GAA a go or soccer? Or rugby? Yeah, out of all my brothers and stuff, well, Jesus played a bit of soccer. Um, but I played everything. Uh, I was playing hur- hurling, you know, playing, playing Gaelic football, soccer boxing just I was involved in all sorts of sports um I was just active I like to I like to be doing something I, I was always small so in football I was good but I probably wasn't as good as what I thought it was because I played for, playing for the younger age because it was so small um yeah. but uh I just I just loved competing and uh, and having you know competition yeah, so well, I'm going to skip forward a few years now, just before yeah. the London 2012 Olympics. So you're only you're only 19 going to the Olympics, which is nuts. Yeah. Really. So you're only 19. Uh, what was the actual training set up in the Irish camp? So you're you're all in, you're getting funding. Am I right here that you're yeah. getting funding and yeah. you're living in Dublin, training like five yeah. six days a week? Is it? So a lot of the fighters, I only kind of get on the funding just the year before. I only get on to the team the year before, but I had to win like. Three, three or four competitions, and then I came. I got the last six, the last eight in the world, and the last eight in Europe. And I kind of got on funding then, so my funding hadn't really even started before I went to the Olympics. I was just kind of living out of my man dad's pocket, you know, whatever they had, they were giving me for going down. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when the funding started, it was fantastic. Uh, but uh, up until then, yeah, it was like I was even under age. Before before we even got the the kind of elite kind of set up, there on the age thing, I was winning all Ireland teams, and I was never getting selected for the team because it was too late. And then yeah. when down, I was invited down one year to Dublin, and uh, one of the coaches asked me what was I doing there, and it was like I was only young. I was what, fourteen or fifteen. I felt like I felt like shit. If I'm honest, I felt it was like. It put me down in front of the whole team. You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing here? He actually was, called you out in front of everyone and said that. Did he? I said, like, what, what? What are you? You're not on the list. What are you here for? I was like, well, I am on the list. I was invited down, so that made me feel shit. I didn't go back to Dublin then. Um, in terms of national national team stuff, I just trained away with my dad. Dumb young thing. I'm up, up north. Um, and then when I ended up getting on to the team, was was my first. You know, my second, my second All Ireland uh, as as a senior. Um, the first one, Conor Hearn beat me. Uh, I was only 17. Mm. And then the second one, when I went to, uh, I ended up winning and got onto the team. And as a senior, uh, that first year, I think I fought the most of everybody on the team as as one of the Irish members. I fought something like 17 times that year um, and lost twice in the 17 times. And that was a, a European quarterfinal and a world quarterfinal. The world quarterfinal was only beat by a point uh, against Andrew Selby, which I thought I won. That, but I'm actually glad because the way it worked out, the Cuban who beat me in, in London 2012 beat him the fate before me. So that's why probably the scene would have, would have worked. So it was probably meant to be. Um, but I once once we got down to Dublin, like it was it was different. I, I kind of was Paddy Barnes kind of took me under under his wing and helped show me the way. Well. He kind of did more so at the Olympics. Before the Olympics, I think I was doing his head in a bit because I was always worrying about my own weight and, and what it was like. And he was the only person I knew who really struggled too. So I think it annoyed him, me asking him, what we do, what we do. I kept asking him just to get a bit of comfort from himself. And uh, until like, London 2012 is when we really kind of 
became really close because we, we shared an experience, which, you know, not many people will. Yeah. We'll get into London 2012 in a minute, but just going back to that coach who called you out in front of everyone, did you ever get a chance to go back to him with your bronze medal or, and say, that's nah, what I'm doing here? Um, no, nah, I didn't. No, didn't never saw him? Didn't even bother. No, I know who it is. I know his name. I wouldn't. don't eat this thing. It's just... It, he probably wouldn't even remember it, and he probably didn't mean it at the same time. You know, probably the, the list that wasn't my name probably wasn't on the list, but I wasn't very down. So, um, it probably wasn't out of badness, but it felt horrible at the time. Bad, bad choice in the moment, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of that Olympics, and that kind, that kind of shot you to national fame. Like, yeah. you, you almost came from nowhere. Like, only nineteen years of age, you came back with a bronze medal. Yeah. Uh, what like a lot of people think in terms of like in terms of your mental strength, it's when it's yeah. when you get a setback. That's when you you really need to be mentally strong. But when you get a success yeah. like that at that age, that's when I mean that can be tough mentally as well. If I, I mean I couldn't even imagine being an Olympic medalist at 19 years of age. I'd probably still be in a pub now, like wearing a medal, you know. So did you? How did you kind of recenter after that? You know what it was like became famous overnight and uh, everybody in the country well it felt like everybody in the country knew who it was and it was amazing it was unbelievable it was it was it was it was class you could go out anywhere you wanted people were on free drinks at you and you know the thing what it does and what I know it does is it starts to feed your ego and your ego starts to get big and you start to think you're better than what you actually are and in 2013 I ended up moving up to fifty six kilo from fifty two, but I was I was growing as well. But at the same time, I wasn't living the life which I should be living, and I I get beat by Selby again in the in the world in the European final um, on a split decision when I wasn't even taking boxing seriously um, as serious as what I should. I was just living a lifestyle where I could just be, I was out I was out drinking. I was sneaking out of out of. Uh, out of the national setup and going the coppers and stuff, so um, it was crazy. It was like I was, I was getting away with doing it, and, and and I was still winning. I was winning. I was winning, winning competitions and stuff. It wasn't like it was. I was my form was was dipping, but I believe it probably should have been excelling much more if I had lived the life um, for that year. So that's that was kind of the when I, I lost in the final. And then I went to the Worlds that year and moved up because I couldn't make the weight. And I actually lost the, the guy beat me in 2016. Um, it was a close fight. It was only up at the division three days. I thought I won it as well, but it was much closer than what it was in, in, in Rio. Um, but after that, I decided in 20, from 2014, I says, I don't, have, I don't have all my life doing this stuff. I just got to you know, make sure I do it right and do it correctly. Sat down and spoke with my dad. I told him I'll, I'll not I'll not lose again this year. Um, so I went to home in 2014 undefeated um, with just surreal focus, um, ready to beat anybody and believing I was better than anybody. I could beat anybody, but putting the work in to back up that belief. I was actually going to say that to you because I have your like I have your amateur records here. So obviously London 2012, you got bronze. Uh, Europeans 2013 you got silver so like massive achievements but just yeah. falling short but then if you look yeah. Commonwealth gold 2014 uh, yeah. European gold 2015 world gold 2015 and the first Irishman to ever do that like a, a yeah. ridiculous achievement so I was going to say obviously you were you were getting more into your 20s then so you were getting your man strength but I was going to say yeah. was it was there was there a mental switch that went off with you just more laser like focus was it Matt, so there was one or there was a few things like the twenty fourteen thing. I got injured in twenty fourteen as well, even though I didn't know that year I got injured before the Commonwealth Games and I was told to may may not be able to box. So I was like me. And to hear that, to hear someone say that you may not be able to box again. It's what injury was it? Uh, it was a hand injury. Um, a bad hand injury, which is alright now, there's no problems, it hasn't been no problems since. So I was told that, you know, it could be a career in and that was that was scary. Like I, I remember I remember going back and I busted out crying in the house and uh Sean, my partner, she was kinda of helping me and I said, Listen, let's just fuck off we're going holiday. So I went away on holiday, went to Portugal. Just chilled out there for two weeks. My dad was training in the Commonwealth Games team. Um and I was on the team. I was selected for the team. 
I wasn't going. I was like, I'm not going there again. There's no way I'm going to go. I have to get scanned and stuff. And they're going to say I'm not going to be able to go. Didn't get this. So I kind of started to get back in the shame when I get back from the holiday. And I wasn't sparring or anything. I was just training. Got sparring, I think, the week before the games. And uh, I remember when we were leaving to go to the games, I was like, I have a flu, I'm not going. Kind of just, I started to, started to maybe do it myself and like have fear. I don't want to lose. I, don't, I hate losing. So sometimes that fear takes over you and it's like, I'd rather just not do it than lose. Um, and that's the way I was thinking at that time. And my dad told me to shut the fuck up and get on the bus. So I just went, okay. And I got on the bus then. Went to the games and the win the games and basically a week's training, a week, like three days sparring max. Um, and that gave me the biggest boost in confidence that you know I needed at the time. I can imagine, yeah, because I was actually reading up about that Commonwealth Games and you didn't just win it, you, you won it at a canter really, didn't you? Yeah. I had the most fights. I, I thought I was the first fight of the whole games. One of these, I beat, I beat a great fighter and she beat Tapa from India first. He was a world medalist, the IE Games champion, everything. So I beat him first. Then I beat, I think, uh, it was one of the African countries. And then um, I, I can't even, I, I beat a good lot of people there. And it was, it was, a, it was a great game. It was great, a great feeling to go to a game. So even though it's not the Olympic Games, it's a smaller kind of setup, but it's on, it's on TV, yeah. and you know you get a lot of recognition for it. So. You know, it was, to be honest, it was piss easy. Um, <laughs> I flew for it. And uh, that confidence it gave me after not wanting to go and fearing that I, I wasn't ready. Yeah. yeah. Um, to show that I could do it at that kind of, you know, at th- that easy was, 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 was great for me. Yeah. And then in 2015, that's when the mad achievement came, when you became the first Irishman to win gold at yeah. the World Amateur Championships. So... Going into that tournament, like, are you able to separate? Like, you always hear these sayings, or just like if it's a cup final in football, just take it as another yeah. game. But, like, that's not just another tournament for you. You have a chance to make history for your country. So, are you able to put that out of your mind completely and just focus on your performance in the ring? Or did you so, feel extra pressure? 2015, I can't just say, like, I went to the World Championships, so I, I, I'm one, I'm one goal and being the first person to do it. It wasn't as simple and as uh, and as pl- plain sailing as that. I went to the WSB first. So the World Championships were the first qualifier for, for the Olympics, the first amateur boxing qualifier, apparently. But there was WASB, which is the World Series of Boxing, which pros can enter as well. Yeah. And uh, so I, I decided, me and Paddy decided we'll go to WSB with Italia Thunder. And they pay, usually pay in WSB. We said, well, we'll not take money as long as we're the number one fighter. So... We done that. Went to the went to WSB and we ended up qualifying through over fourteen weeks, fighting every second week, so seven fights, um, in all foreign countries. The last one being Venezuela, and uh, it didn't look like I was going to qualify because the way it kind of played out, there was someone who beat me in the first fight, which was uh, an Azerbaijani. Um, he beat me in the first fight, and then I got a bad decision in Kazakhstan. So it was like, I needed someone, the guy beat me to lose to the guy I stopped in the next fight. Um, so it was kind of like, it was a funny situation. I was like, and Nikitin, Nikitin needed to lose. He was, he was in it as well. But he ended up winning. Anyway, he beat Ukraine in Ukraine during all the Crimea stuff. And that was like, I thought, we thought there's no chance they'll win them, but you know, all the Russian team did. And... I qualified through that one the next night. That guy lost. I won. I didn't even go in the trial. When I went in the trial and knocked the guy out, I said that to my dad. And I said, I'm one pro. Um, I'm not going to go to the World Championships and try and qualify here because it's too long. I've been away from my family too long. I've just had a baby, baby girl. So she was. she's the, main, the the reason. My daughter was the reason my mindset kind of changed. Yeah. Um, Give me an, an, an extra bit of focus. Um. I remember going. We went to Venezuela to keep him on the night before the fight. I fucked a bottle of coke across the ring. I was disgusted. I said, "No, I'm just going to try and knock this guy out." 
And when in tried to knock him out, ended up having the war and having a really hard fight, which I couldn't yeah. be very easy for myself. Yeah. The M1 qualified. So I was qualified for the Olympic Games. So I was away, holiday, having fun. Um, comes comes around to June, I'm on holiday and I'm in, in Portugal again, funny enough. And uh, Billy Walsh rings me and says, listen, we're going to send Kurt Walker to the European Championships. And if Kurt Walker uh, qualifies for the World Championships, he'll go to the World Championships and then he can have the possibility of qualifying for the Olympics. Um, so we're going to send him uh, if you don't want to go. And I says, fuck that. So listen, I'm not having no boxers. And I well, encourage good enough to go and win this. I'll just go. He says, but in two, it's in two weeks' time. Can you make the weight? And I says, I'll check what I am. So I'll check my weight. And I was like, 10 kilos overweight. I says, oh, I can make the weight. So straight out, half holiday was basically cut in half. The rest of the holiday was a training camp. I was just running every day, nonstop running. Went to the Europeans, two weeks training. Every night living in a sweatsuit, trying to get the weight down. Ended up winning them at a counter as well. Um, very, very easy. Not very easy. It was just, they were hard, but it made it look easy. Yeah. And I had that belief that I'm better than all of these things. You know, I, I'm qualified for Olympics. I don't need to worry about anything here. I'm just going to enjoy it. And when we were saying there, can you take away the fact that you're going to win a world championship and to be the first person to create history for your country? For me, the more pressure was on qualifying for Olympics. It wasn't about the creating history. Creating history yeah. comes when you're achieving. So my, my pressure was the Olympics because I knew you can create all the history you want, but history doesn't put money in your bank account. And I knew if I had a cut, I, I needed to get the Olympic Games to kind of you know, add them zeros on the paychecks. Yeah. You know, so anyway... Uh, Went that when ended up winning them, went to the world championships, and I was reading the book The Secret, so I was non stop reading it. And, and the power of the power of Nan stuff I was reading, so all those books about you know the law of attraction and everything. And I'm a solid believer in all of it, really. Um, yeah, it, I, I, I do live bad. Um, yeah. I kind of need to get back into it a bit more if I'm honest, but um. I was I was like in the in the consistently and Sean McComb shared a roommate every night. I was just telling him I'm world champion already. I don't need to worry about this. I've put the work in. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't just reading the books and saying it. I was I was I was putting the work in. Yeah. No, like the, the secret. Like it, I know it has a lot of people that don't like it. I like it myself. Yeah. But it's, there's some real powerful stuff in it. Do you yeah. um like so since reading the secret, if you ever find yourself going down a bad road, like thinking negatively, have you, are you now so used to? Are you able to stop your thoughts and just change it and don't go down that road now since reading that book? That's not as it's not that easy. Like it's still hard. It's yeah. still hard and it still happens. Listen, if it doesn't happen, you're not human, really. Everybody has thoughts now. Yeah. It's human nature. It's the way we're bit with the way we're made. Um so you're just trying to be aware of those thoughts and, and when they do creep in, be aware yeah. of what what you're telling yourself and what you're letting your, your mind tell yourself because what your mind is saying is not what you actually believe, it's just what your mind is saying. Your mind's in a person. Yeah. I can I approach it that that is not me speaking. No, I can I can focus thoughts, but it's not me creating the thoughts, it's just thoughts. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think people have to, they have to be, you have to be careful what you're telling your subconscious, really. That's what I always think because what you're telling, what, like, what you're thinking. You are telling your subconscious, and that can come, that can manifest manifest itself then in a bad way, or, or in a good way if you're thinking positively. But uh, what? Sorry, go on. You just need to be aware of it. That's all it is. Yeah. No matter whether it's good or bad, you just need to be aware of it. Hundred percent. Yeah. I want to talk about um, in the actual Irish Olympic uh, setup in the camp. What's the what? How much emphasis is put on sports psychology? So what? Do you have a couple of sports psychologists that work with all of Team Ireland in terms of all the sports, or had the boxing team got their own, or what is the setup? We had our own. It was it was Jerry Hussey was was the one looking after us, and uh, and Jerry Jerry was fantastic for a long time. Um, I, I really more so at the start towards the end. I, I kind of was doing my own stuff with a secret and stuff, and I, I kind of didn't I didn't really feed into what what Jerry was telling me at times. Um, towards the end but at the start it was for me bring me through you know from the first kind of year as a senior until maybe the year before I won the world chart I was after the world was he was there at the world and 
we were going through videos and stuff. Oh, I was actually, I don't know even what I'm talking about, Jerry. It was fantastic the whole time. I remember in the World Championships, we were watching videos, and I was all, I was always telling Jerry, Jerry himself, before he was saying to me, I was saying, I'm already World Champion. And I think I was even getting into his head that I was World Champion. I was getting into everybody's head that I was World Champion. But yeah, it was, it was fantastic, I think. Um, it was definitely what was needed. What kind of things did Jerry work on with you? Like, did you suffer maybe with nerves pre-fight or what, ah, what, what did he do? Uh, it was just reinforcing to good things. Um, you know, it was never really about, I, I never suffered from anything, if I'm honest. I, I, I was always good. And I always had that inner confidence. And I like to, I like to say it loudly. Um, I don't like to kind of hate it and save me. I like to say it loudly because it makes it easier to come out there. Yeah. Um, uh, so it was, it was never really working on anything. It was just reinforcing stuff that's, which we've went through in training camp, going through what we've worked on, um, and, and just seeing what we need to do and taking you know, one second, one minute, one, one, one round at a time. In terms of the rest of the boxers in the camp, like yeah. you're obviously you're not going to be forced to work with Jerry, but yeah. does he just go in and do like a workshop with everyone, and then it's the onus is on you to go and hunt him down if you want to see uh, him? Yeah, I uh, that's get the kind of way it was, you know, Jerry. If you needed Jerry, you go and see Jerry, or if Jerry felt he needed to see you, he'll come and see you. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was more like you know, you kind of we knew our everybody knew their place, and uh, and Jerry knew when he needed to speak and when he didn't need to speak, so it was fantastic. Yeah. Well, moving on then to the Rio 2016, probably one of your most famous moments. Um, it's, obviously, I'm not just saying it because you're here and because I'm Irish, but obviously it was a terrible decision that went against you in the quarterfinals against the uh, Nicotin. Is that how you say it? Just yeah, like the cigarette. Yeah. 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 Nicotin. So basically for the people that are watching that don't know so in professional boxing you don't find out the judges scores until the end of the 12 rounds but in amateur yeah. boxing the television viewers I was watching it with my man Dan sitting room, the television audience actually get the score at the end of each round and yeah. you still there Michael yeah oh yeah cool yeah, yeah, yeah. so the television audience get the score at the end of each round now I remember the first round you won you did win clearly and yeah. then it comes back oh my god uh, the Russian has got the first round and I always remember RTE's uh, commentary at the time there was just a real kind of a they were kind of like oh here we go something something fishy is happening here mm-hmm. so what I, what I want to know is like do you as a fighter find out that you've lost that round? No but we did because Paddy Barnes was up beside the TV screens watching what was going Everything on down, was it? Down. <laughs> he, was, he was shooting down to the, to the boys and uh, letting them know and then you know my father and, and Zora and the whole team, they were told a few days previous that, you know, this is going to happen. Um, if you're not, if your boy's not getting the decision, go try to get some help. And they were told that. And uh, no one said to me, Paddy knew, my family knew who were there. And they said, so they go on their funeral, they knew it was happening. And then after an amazing first round, I'm down. And I remember my dad getting up and saying in the corner, you can fucking knock his cunt out, go and knock him out. So I says, okay, I know I can. He was yeah. telling me kind of the whole day before and the day of it, no, you know, you can stop this guy and stuff. I said, God, definitely, 100%. Well, he never, actually told, well, he never actually told you that nah. he had heard this, no? Uh, they've done the right thing by not telling me. Yeah, yeah. They've done the right thing by not telling me. And, and, and the thing with the finger salute and, and, and me giving off the way he gave off, the finger salute... That was something I was going to do in the WSB because I thought that was my amateur career over. Remember, I was telling you earlier about how the decisions, I got screwed over and yeah. then it looked like I wasn't going to qualify and I would have went pro. After that fight in Venezuela, I was just going to give the fingers to the judges and say, fuck you, I'm going pro. But it was that, I made the fight that tough that I couldn't do it. I just had to clap the crowd. The crowd was fantastic. So <laughs> just that, was that was something. Listen, I, I, I was an amateur boxer for 18, 20, 18 years of my life or so. And the way the decisions is when I asked me in the past, I've never said anything. I was always kind of saying, once I go pro, I'll tell them how I feel. And, you know, that's, that, was, that, was, that was already going, that was going to happen. No matter what, they screwed me over in the end. Um, so that's why that happened. 
going back to the, the end of that first round, so when Paddy Barnes shouts down that you've you've lost that first round, you obviously you've boxed hundreds, thousands of rounds, so you, you know in your heart I haven't lost that round. Like, yeah, like, yeah. But yeah. how does your how does your mindset change? And do you actually get angry and go to cheating bastards, nah, or can you just separate it, and go? It, ah, I'll just focus on my nah, performance. Just as I'm going forward then and, and, and take them out. So yeah. if you look in the second round, there's a few times where I actually need to stop him. And the referee jumps in and wipes my head for no reason. He has a good hair, a massive gash, hasn't he? He has a gash on his head. Yeah. Then stops and wipes his cup. But the blood isn't going into anybody's eyes, so there's no need to wipe the blood. It's not even on faces. It's on, yeah. on the back of his head. Um, or on the side of his head. So if it was running into his eyes, yes, you can say, okay, you need to stop and wipe it. But there was so much stuff which was going on. I remember before, even before the fight had even started, when we were in the ring, the referee said, come over and check your gloves and check your groin guard and stuff, see if you ever come to you. And then she said, before I'd even done anything, keep your head up. So it was like, she was all ready on the case. Yeah. And like I, when I seen the referee, I was like, I'm sorted. of this girl is refereed my European gold and my world gold. You know, she's refereed those bouts. So the fact that that happened the way it did, um, was just a, it was very annoying. You know? I, I just I, I changed the style. I went in the second round, and I felt I beat him up even more. And it was I was just that came back after that round, and I, and he gave me that round. But that was yeah. a, I think that was a little. You you have it, mate. No, you don't really. But no, I mean it was just one of them ones. Yeah. And then the, obviously the, I thought the third because I actually watched it last week again. Yeah. The third I thought the third round was nearly your cleanest round, and they gave so, it to him. I always thought that from watching it the, fir- the first time I watched it back, I thought the third round was my worst round. And then I watched it pre the Keaton and the pros. And I think the third round was my best round. It was, yeah. It was fairly, fairly undeniable that you won it. Like the only way you lose it is if you're getting shafted, which obviously happened. But then um, obviously the interview with RTE is just le- legendary. It goes down in <laughs> RTE folklore. Um, are you aware? Like straight away that night, the like the the groundswell of support you have from back home. Because I'll give you an example. I'm watching the fight with my parents. My my ma doesn't care about boxing. She knows nothing about boxing. But she's watching your interview and you're going these cheating bastards and all this. And usually usually she wouldn't be too keen on that kind of language. But even she was kind of going, "Go on, Michael. Go on. Fair play to you." Because it was just uh, like we all kind of felt as though it was just one of our own had been shafted. Like so, did you get that feeling of national support straight away? Oh. In the immediate aftermath after the interview, first thing I like, what the fuck have I done? <laughs> There's like no one's gonna to want to touch me with a contempt report. Now that I know that professional boxing loves this kind of shit um, and loves that uh, outpour of rage, um, but once I got back to, the, to my apartment, I left. I left. I left the, the village right away. Um, went straight to the apartment when. Where my, where my fiance and my daughter and my, my, my brother were. Um, I remember like thinking I'd fucked up and then I lifted my phone. I was like from like fucking 13 or 14,000 followers or 20,000 followers or it was up to like 105 or something right away. I was like, well, I might have done something right here. Yeah, it blew up. Didn't and it? then everybody, t- I think I could, there was no way I could have made it for half of the messages. Um, seeing uh, the, the, how much people and the, the, the high level of people who were on my side was unbelievable. And, and from home, from, from abroad, from, from Brazil, from, from China, everybody was kind of behind me. And, you know, it was, it was great then. It was great to see it. And, and it made the whole thing much easier. Yeah. What do you actually do that night? Do you just sit there? Like, do you, do you cry yourself? I got a sleep? shower. I got back in. The, I, went, I got back to the, the the apartment and I got a shower and I remember standing in the shower. I was just cry my eyes. Yeah, yeah. I'd be honest. Like I'm not, I'm not one of the people that says it doesn't cry. I've, I've mentioned it before. Times I've cried in this already. Yeah. Um, but I remember crying my eyes. I was devastated because being an Olympic champion was my dream since I was seven years of age when I started boxing. Yeah. Once watching like. Amir Khan and Andy Lee when they were in the 2004 race, probably the first Olympic memory I have, which means I would have, I would have been around 13 or something, but I would be the first Olympic boxing memory I had, but watching the Olympics has always been something my dad's done, so he's, he was big in the Olympics from when we were kids and in the yeah. sport in general, so you know I would have watched sport always, and yeah. uh, 
it was it was you know it was exciting for me to even be in Olympic Games and and to go and win a medal in 2012 was unbelievable and then the only reason to stay it after 2012 was to be an Olympic champion and for that to be pulled away from me was was heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an awful harsh way. Like whatever, but if you get robbed in a in a fight, you could, there's always the next fight. But Olympics is once every four years. That was that was the time. So it was a it was a horrible time, a horrible time to get robbed. But um, yeah. do you think in terms of your profile then turning professional, aside from winning gold, it's probably the best thing that could happen to you. This is, I think, even if I won gold, I wouldn't be in the position I'm in right now. Yeah, and that's the truth. Um. Would I go back and change it to win, a, win an Olympic gold to be where I am now? Um, no, I wouldn't. I would leave it the way it was because I'm in a fantastic position. Um, I'm always going to secure my, my future for my family. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the verge of winning world titles. And, you know, who, who, can, who can do a debut? Like, my debut. No one has ever done something like that as a professional. And that didn't happen because I won an Olympic gold medal. That happened because of I get screwed over. So, yeah. you know, that's something, you know, I can look back on with happiness for what happened in the Olympics. Yeah, that's good. But um, in terms of when you turn pro then, yeah. you move to America, which I'm like, you're obviously, yeah. you're an Olympic, you're a high pedigree amateur. So any coach in Ireland or the UK would have been happy to work with you, I've no doubt. But you yeah. open to America. Is there something in terms of, do you want to escape your comfort zone there somewhere where nobody really knows you? I wanted to learn the Mexican state of boxing and you know the you hear about how tough sparring is in LA and, and and you know the different kind of styles you're going to face more so suited to the pro game whereas in, in, in Ireland and the UK it's very European boxing you know yeah. that technical side of it and, and skillful side of it which I had down the Um but I went over to LA for the year just to kind of learn that and, and kind of learned the trade the tough way and they did um, it was very tough um, the sparring was fantastic learned an awful lot but it wasn't where I wanted to, to live forever and it wasn't some it wasn't a style which I thought is suited to me so you know I thought it would have been better for me to come back and train with Adam Bruce yeah well just going to your, your debut then so you've got one of the most legendary debuts ever it's Paddy's yeah. Paddy's weekend Madison yeah. Square Garden. I've I've only been in Madison Square Garden once, and like for a boxing fan, you can just feel the history yeah. of the place. So Ali Fraser, all that, and obviously yeah. the massive Irish community in New York as well. And just yeah. for the cherry on top, you're uh, you're walked out by Conor McGregor. Uh-huh. So like like hey, look when you're in that dressing room, can you focus purely on your performances? You're not a part of you going. What the fuck is this? No, it was when I look back, it was a fucking shambles in terms of my preparation for really? the fight itself like I don't think I had warm up I don't know be about five minutes pods before I went out to the ring that's the only one I've done McGregor in the change room loud as shit <laughs> just there was no focus in terms of what I was doing what I needed to go and do and you can tell in the performance you know it was it was rushed it was it wasn't a good performance I don't think but I just wanted to get the guy out of there because I had whatever it was, five, six thousand Irish fans bam for blood wanting that wanting to see the stoppage and you know get it all done with and go out and celebrate. So yeah. I remember walking out and I was shh and the land like listen, see when people say that don't be nervous going they fight, they're fucking really just lies. It's yeah. lies and it pisses me off. I, I see I, I don't care who you are, you feel nervous when you're going to fight. It's oh, not yeah. natural for a human being to fake another human being that's not natural so yeah. obviously you have that fear factor in there I remember before before the ring walk started I was fucking just like jeez Christ fuck me let's go I was nervous I wasn't like overly nervous where I was just going to fucking break down or but I, I, I was really nervous and then as soon as the doors opened and I seen the fans it felt like I was at home the nerves disappeared and usually it's not until the first bell rings where the nerves disappear for me but when I fight New York, it's as soon as they indulge them, they disappear. Yeah. What What did you learn from that one then? Like, did, did you make any choices after that, thinking like, I'm not going to do what I done then? Like, you know, I'm going to maybe avoid the pageantry of having Conor McGregor and things like that. Yeah. No. I I learned that you know I need to have focus before I step out there. 
I need to have the warmth. I need to do the things which I done to get me in this position throughout the amateur game. Nine. Yeah. Um, I need to kind of reinforce those instead of just dilly dallying, having fucking hip go la, everybody going crazy. Um, shit. But there's no ingredients behind. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, I just needed to have my 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 right team around right time. Yeah. Um, speaking of McGregor now, I kind of want to link you and him together for one moment here because your next fight is going to be behind closed doors, isn't it? Yeah. 15th of August. So basically, I always think you and McGregor are similar in terms of like, you know, he comes out with this saying like, uh, oh, when one of us go to war, we all go to war and all, which, like, which literally speaking isn't actually true. He is the one doing it. But I feel like he, especially on his rise in his early days in the UFC, he felt almost like he was an Irish warrior in representing mm-hmm. us. You know, he comes out to the foggy Jew and the place is just going mad. Just, I don't know what the word is, but just this massive Irishness behind him. Yeah. You're, you're similar in a way. Like, you come out to Grace, which is like a, it's a meaningful song to the Irish people. It carries a lot of weight yeah. behind it. And obviously thousands of Irish there for you. So you've got that kind of Irish positivity behind you as well. Yeah. Now, your next fight, it's going to be in an empty arena. I so, know. like, would... Are you worried that that will have a negative impact that you won't have that, or or if you detach that emotion, can you focus just on your performance? Well, in terms of the fans, nah, let's make them focus on performance. There's been many times as an amateur yeah. where you're in the Europeans or you're in the World Championships, and there's ten people in the arena. You know what I mean? There's there's not many people there, and they're not cheering for you anyway. So it's like, you know, what what are we doing here, team? So I've boxed in front of empty arenas. I've been sparring in the gym. Obviously, people in the gym when they're sparring, but there will be people there in the arena, not like fans, but there'll be people, people there. And the people in the gym here watching sparring aren't fans either. So, I've been sparring about the music on, I've been, I've been doing little things, um, just let, let myself get used to that, you know, that environment as a because as a professional, I have not boxed in front of an empty arena. Yeah, every, yeah. every, every time I'm boxing professional, there's been a fan base there for me. Yeah, and you know, that's something I appreciate, but. It's not going to happen this time, so I just gotta, I gotta get on with business. Yeah, I want to talk about um, Adam Booth for a minute. Your, your trainer. So like, I, I love like you know the HBO twenty four seven programs. Now I love hearing coaches talk, and for some reason I've always had a bit of an obsession with Adam Booth because I used to be a massive David Hay fan, and I, yeah. I love, I love the way he talks to his fighters. He, he's, he always seems to be so calm. I've never really seen him read the riot act. So mm. does he, like, does he calm you down, and does, does he make you appreciate that maybe like being calm in a fight? Is probably the way to go for you. Of course, of course. He's listen. Like you, I was a fan of of hearing him speak. When you hear his interview, I'll watch an interview of Adam has done the interview before I was with him even as well, because I like to hear his philosophy and things and how he approaches training and what he says about this and what he thinks about that. So, um, working with him is fantastic. He's a great coach in the corner. He knows what to say when they say it. He doesn't say too much, and he stays relaxed. And, and that's something I've always enjoyed. Yeah. You know, I, I don't like people shouting at my face. I don't need that. I know what I need to do. If you tell me, now nah, you need to one put it on him. You need to fuck him up. I'll do it. You know, you don't need to shout it at me. Yeah. Um, or if you're telling me you're behind, you can say it and be a bit angry, and be a bit yeah. aggressive. You don't need to shout it because it doesn't matter what I'm still going to go and push. You know, I'm not the type of fighter it needs. If I work part of my arse, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go Yeah. And in terms of like your, your preparation for a fight, because he seems like such a thorough man. I'm a real deep thinking man as well. Obviously, I don't know him just from watching interviews and stuff. But um, do you ever talk about a pot- like potential negative situations? Like, I mean, the possibility is there that you maybe could get buzzed in a fight one day. Do you ever talk about what to do in a situation if you do get dropped? And maybe just so if that does happen, that yeah. maybe the panic doesn't set in. Of course, you have, to, you have to. You have to. You have to look at all all situations, and you know the main thing to do is figure out not not just how to win, but how not to lose. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't need to lose. So if you are hurt, you know you know what you need to do. You need to do this. You need to do that. We have, we have spoke about all things like this. Um, it's something that comes with you know the territory as a fighter. There always there always is risk. Yeah. There always. And no matter what it is, boxing is a game of chance. Anything can happen. When you step into that ring, anybody can win. Yeah. It just has to happen. It can happen. And, and it can happen. You need to be prepared for it. And, and that's the thing is, once, once you prepare 
not to lose. You can't. You you cannot fail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So before we finish up, then I'm just gonna actually one thing. One more thing I want to ask you just about actual fight day. What is your uh, routine on fight day? Because I'm always fascinated by how how fighters kill that time, that dead space before a fight. Fight day. I hate fight day. I hate it. Yeah. It's like twelve o'clock in the afternoon on fight day. I'm like. Fuck this! I wish this is tomorrow and I have won already. Yeah, people, yeah. If people, if people really do enjoy it, fair play to them. But I don't, and I'll be honest, I don't enjoy fight day. It's too long. Yeah. You wait too long. Usually, we go a walk and stuff, but I don't think you're able to do it now with this fucking COVID stuff. You're locked in a hotel, I think. So yeah. um, you can't even go and go walk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a PlayStation and I'm going to play the PlayStation. And if time needs to be done. I'll sit on play with Call of Duty Warzone. And uh, do some shit like that, you know, get my, get my reaction to him up for shooting people. <laughs> hang, hang the head of the next guy. Yeah. You think about the fight like all day or do you actually actively try to put it out of your mind? Try not to, try not to. I'll yeah. stay crazy. And then that's the bit where your mindset is very important because the what ifs creep in. Yeah. What, what of that? That little voice going, what is this? What of that? So you've got to be very, very careful. Yeah. Because thoughts. Would Adam would Adam give you much information in the change room on fight there? It's all done in training. All done. It's all yeah. done. Just tell the reinforced things which we've done. Yeah. Tell yeah. me this is what we're working on. This is what we're going to do. Done for twelve weeks or however long it's been. Just go out and do it, and that's all it is. That's brilliant. So just two questions that I'm going to finish up asking everybody that comes on. First one is, if you could pick an athlete, it doesn't have to be in your sport in any sport that you admire from a mental point of view. Who would it be and why? It's a hard one. Um, Michael Jordan. Yeah. You're watching that mm. documentary series, eh? Just that, that selfishness, which you have to have. People may think you're a dick or you know, a bad but it's not. If you have that ultimate drive to win, you have to be selfish. The, the greatest athletes in the world are probably the most selfish people, but it's to reach those pinnacles of sport, you need to have that. 100%, yeah. And then the last one I want to ask you is, if you were to go back to the start of your career, now I know that boxing's a bit different because you've been an amateur and pro, let's just say go back to, and if you spoke to yourself at the beginning of the London 2012 Olympics, and you were to give that younger version of you one piece of advice from a mentality point of view that maybe you know now that you didn't know then, what would that be? I think I would just say always remain focused and don't get too far ahead of yourself. Yeah. Because that's where the pitfalls are. When you start to get too far ahead of yourself and you start to slip up, don't slip up, stay focused. And that's one thing that I still live by now because I'm 28, I have two kids, I can't let anything slip me up. I can't believe my head, I can't believe in anything. I've just got to make sure I keep putting that work in. And have that, you know, scourge and hard, yeah, to make myself the ultimate boxer, which I can't be. Yeah, so brilliant. it's a brilliant attitude. But do you have like so? Do you have more short term goals then than long term goals? You just take it fight by fight, literally. I'll beat this guy. This next guy, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna fight in August fifteenth here. I'll beat this guy, Sophie Antikut, and then I want to world title. Next fight, That's a short term goal. Yeah. Cool. I saw, saw your fight name on August 15th. Where can people watch that? You broke up, Aaron. Sorry. Your box on August 15th. Where can we watch that fight? Is it on a BT? It's, it's going to be a BT Sport. BT Sport. Saturday, August 15th. Cool. Listen, Michael, I'm not going to take any more of your time, but thanks a million for taking the time to come on. Like I said, you didn't have to do it, but... Really, really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll do it face-to-face one day with a few world title belts and a few, a few pints. Definitely. Thank you, Mohammed. Appreciate Cheers. it. Thanks, Thanks man. Bye-bye. There we go. First podcast in the bag. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, you can share it around with friends or family or anybody that you think might be interested in the mental side of sport. So obviously there's the YouTube link and I've also shared the audio version of it on all of the different podcast sites. So... Basically, wherever you get your podcast, you'll be able to get this. If you just type in the top two inches of sport, you'll be able to find it. So, and if you are watching the YouTube link, I know the 
the camera wasn't great but that's going to be fixed for the next episode hopefully the next one it won't look quite as choppy and pasty i'll still be pasty but just not hopefully as bad as it was today and um, yeah massive thanks again to michael Conlon. brilliant to have an athlete at that level on to talk about the mental side of his game so best of luck again michael on the 15th of august on bt sport we're all behind you thanks everyone see you next week Oh Grace, just hold me in your arms And let this moment linger They'll take me out of dark And I will die With all my love I'll place this wedding ring Upon your finger there won't be time to share our love, for we must say goodbye.